Jesus said he was the way, the truth, and the life. Because he is the way, we will never get lost. Because he is the truth, we will never be confused. And because he is the life, we need never be depressed. I'm really delighted to spend the next few moments with you, telling you some of the things that I've heard, some of the things I've read, and some of the things I've thought about this most wonderful person, the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, Christianity is not about religion. Religion is man's search for God. Christianity is God's search for man. Christianity is about a person. And I trust that after this time that we've spent together that you'll know this wonderful person perhaps even better than you have before now. Down the corridors of time has traveled a man whose life and spirit have changed men's lives and shape the course of history as no other man has ever done. Art galleries have tried to capture his life in paintings. Libraries are lined with books exploring his thoughts. Hospitals and schools are dedicated to his memory. He is the focus of controversy, but he's also the rallying point of unity. He's the object of love. He's the subject of debate. He's the basis for hope and the goal for many people's lives. And no man interested in the meaning of life and its ultimate questions can ignore Jesus Christ. He towers above the giants of history. To some, he's an uneasy feeling in times of silence. To others, he's a sunrise of hope in a night of darkness. But to all of us, he is a challenge. And wherever I hear, whenever I hear someone say that they reject Jesus Christ or Christianity or the church for that matter, I feel like saying back to them, so would I if I had the same thoughts and ideas about Jesus and the church and Christianity as you probably do. I wish they had never heard those misrepresentations of Christ, the church, or Christianity. Because it is the distorted ideas that prevent us from discovering the real truth and most importantly, the real Jesus. Unfortunately, it's not always their fault. The magnificent truth, though, for each of us, that is, each of us who really cares to find out, is this, that the person who masterminded all of creation, the whole universe, we're talking about the God who created all of this. Here's the most phenomenal truth about Christianity. It is that this mastermind This person in charge of all once ate and slept and breathed and walked on this planet, just like you and I. You see, Christianity holds, and history verifies it, that the infinite God in the person of Jesus Christ at a point in time crossed an unimaginable barrier and personally entered into human history. And before such an undreamable dream, the intellect falters. How could this possibly be true? Why would God come here? I think the answer, and someone said it this way, it's because love does such things. You see, Christ is the only person who pre-existed his birth. I want to say that again. Don't miss this. Christ is the only person who pre-existed his birth on this planet. That's because he lived before he was born here as the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes laid in a manger. He always existed and he simply entered in space, time, and geography on this planet in a moment, in the fullness of time, the scripture describes it. He came here. He came as a babe, but he was before he was born here. He certainly was here on the earth, but you see, he was certainly from the sky. Men have been, men have been so wrong about God that he had to come here and tell them who he really was and to show them 
what he is really like. And he left his traces and his fingerprints and his footprints on everything that he has touched, whether it's people, planets, or stars. And when he was here, he held crowds spellbound for hours, even children. Children really liked him. And his followers, they tried to chase the children off, but he said, don't do that for such is the kingdom of heaven. Children really liked him. His followers developed a deep affection for him. And these clues of how people felt, that is the people that were around him, suggest that Jesus was very attractive. Not, not because of his physical appearance necessarily, because remember, the prophet Isaiah said that there was no beauty that we should desire him. Not because of his beauty, a physical beauty, but perhaps it was because of the warmth of his person and of his personality. He lived a rugged lifestyle. He walked miles in all kinds of weather. He spent whole nights in prayer. He frequently spent the night out under the stars. And these facts suggest that he may have been physically fit and strong, and for these reasons, many experts think that they can say that Jesus was attractive and noble in appearance. But the fact is that we're not really sure how he looked. The important thing is not how he looked, but what he was, what he said, and what he continues to do through us by the power of his spirit. You see, in a world where there is death and dying, suffering and sickness, failure and fear, war and turmoil, heartbreak and division and divorce. Something is desperately needed. It takes more than a smear of religious cosmetics to fix we humans. It takes energy and information and dynamics. Yet even these things fall lifelessly and purposely and, and coldly fall short because what's really needed is the entrance of a person, a person, a person with feeling, a person with compassion. Tenderness and care is needed. We need salve for our sores. And so Jesus, his name, the scripture says, is like ointment poured forth. And that's why they give him names, names like Savior and Prince of Peace and Lord and Master. <laughs> Jesus, that's what we need. You see, he was hungry and yet he fed multitudes. He was thirsty and yet he was the water of life. He paid taxes and yet he is the King of Kings. He prayed and yet he's the one who hears our prayers. He wept, and yet he's the only one that can wipe the tear from every human eye. He was sold for 30 pieces of silver, and yet he paid the price to redeem the whole human race. You see, you see, we humans need a lot of help because we tend to bring a lot of hell into life. And so someone is needed. Someone who can take out the hell and bring in some of heaven, and that's exactly what he did. He came from the bosom of the Heavenly Father to the bosom of an earthly woman. He was born in a manger that you might live in a mansion. He became the Son of Man, so we who are the sons of men might become the sons of God. He was made sin that we might be made the righteousness of God. He became sorrowful that we might be made exceedingly uh, great in joy. He became poor that we might become rich. He became a partaker of our human nature so we could become a partaker of his divine nature. He put on humanity so we could put on divinity. He became weary so that we might have rest. He became the companion of sinners so that we might know the companionship of God. He was homeless that we might have an eternal habitation. He was condemned that we might not be condemned. He became a servant so that we could be made kings. He was stripped that we might be brought nigh. He was forsaken that we might be received. He died that we might live. He entered the realm of darkness so that we could live in the kingdom of light. 
He was silent so that we might speak. He was humbled that we might be exalted. He was put down so we could be lifted up. He was rejected so that we might be accepted. He became an outcast that we might never be cast out. He was crucified for us so that we could reign with him. He wore a crown of thorns so that we could wear a crown of everlasting glory. You see, he was abused and tempted and persecuted and despised and derided and betrayed and denied and smitten and scourged and buffeted and blasphemed. He was frowned upon by proud and oppressed by power. The fact is he gave up all things that we might receive all things. The Lord Jesus Christ is the all in all of those of us who are redeemed. In every want, He is our friend. In every danger, our defense. In every weakness, He is our strength. In sorrow, He's our joy. In pain, He is our peace. In poverty, He's our provider. In sickness, He is the great physician. In hunger, He is the bread of life. In, in our thirst, He is the water of life. And if we're in trouble, He is our consolation. And if we're in perplexity, He is our counselor. In our, and when we're in the furnace, the fire reflection, he is the refiner. In the floods, he's the rock. In our assaults, he is our refuge. In, in accusation, he's our advocate. In debt, he's our surety. In slavery, he is our ransom. In captivity, he's our deliverer. In the daytime, it's like he's the sun. And in the nighttime, he is our keeper. In the desert, He's our shepherd, and in life he is our hope. In death, he is our life. In the grave, he is our resurrection. And in the kingdom, he is our glory. You see, the name of Jesus, think about it for a moment. Say it, Jesus. I don't know how many times I've watched somebody come to an old-fashioned altar and not knowing what to say or how to pray have just said his name, Jesus. And I've seen immediate change in people's lives. There's power in his name. You see, the name of Jesus throbs with all of life. It weeps with all pathos. It groans with all pain. It stoops with all love. It, his name, like I've already said, it's like ointment, healing ointment poured forth. There's no one like him. Who? Who like Jesus can pity the homeless orphan? Or who like Jesus can welcome a prodigal back home? Who like Jesus can make a drunkard sober? Who like Jesus can illuminate a cemetery full of graves and say, come forth, and they come? Who like Jesus can make a queen out of the lost woman of the streets? Who like Jesus can catch the tears of human sorrow in his bowl, and who, like Jesus, can kiss away our sorrow? When I think of Jesus, I struggle. I struggle to speak of him. I struggle for a me metaphor to express Jesus. You see, he, he, he's not like the bursting forth of an orchestra because that's too loud and it might be out of tune. He's not like the sea where the waves lash and rage by a storm. That's far too boisterous. He's not like a mountain that's, even a mountain that's wreathed in lightning or canopied with snow. That's, that's too solitary and remote. Jesus. I've thought about him when I heard about the artist painting a cold, wintry, blizzard scene. And uh, all of the colors were dull, blacks and grays, and the wind was blowing. You could feel it as you looked at the blizzard. And there in the storm of that wintry blizzard was a little cottage, cold, cruel, it looked, and lonely, and deserted. And then the artist took his pen and his brush, rather, and dipped it. And with one stroke and a smear of yellow, he put a light on it inside the cottage. And the picture changed. And that's what it's like to have Jesus come in. He changes the picture. 
He brings warmth into the coldness. He brings light into darkness. He brings life into despair and, and into the darknesses of life. Now, this Jesus is the subject of every book in the Bible. In Genesis, he's the seed of the woman that would bruise the serpent's head. In Exodus, he's the Passover lamb. In Leviticus, he was the high priest. In Numbers, if you remember, he was the cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night. In Deuteronomy, he was a prophet like unto Moses. In Joshua, he was the captain of our salvation. In the book of Judges, he is the righteous judge and the lawgiver. In the book of Ruth, he's our kinsman redeemer. In Samuel, he's the trusted prophet. In Kings and Chronicles, he's the reigning king. In Ezra, he's the faithful scribe. In Nehemiah, he's the rebuilder of the broken down walls of our human lives. In the book of Esther, he's our Mordecai. In Job, he is the everlasting redeemer. Oh, listen to Job. Few people knew him like Job did. For Job was able to, he know, knew him so well, he was able to say that though you slay me, yet well, I trust you. And then he said, uh, remember, we, we quote this at almost every funeral. Job said, I know that my redeemer liveth. And that he shall stand at the latter day upon the earth, and though my skin worms destroy this body, yet in my flesh I shall see God. In the book of Psalms, he's the Lord our shepherd. In the book of Proverbs, he's the voice of wisdom crying in the streets. In Ecclesiastes, he's the wisdom of the preacher. In the songs of Solomon, he is Jesus, the lover of our souls. And if you'll plug into chapter 2 and listen You'll not only find him, but you might even hear his voice, for the writer said this, O oh, my dove, that art in the cleft of the rock, in the secret places of the stairs, let me see thy countenance, and let me hear thy voice, for sweet is thy voice, and thy countenance is comely. In the book of the Song of Solomon, he's the lover of our souls, you'll find him there. In Isaiah, he's the Prince of Peace, and yet... You know, Isaiah named him so many times in so many different ways. Remember, in chapter 9, Isaiah said, For unto us a child is born, and unto us a son is given. The government shall be upon his shoulders. Listen to this. And his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. And of the increase of his government and of his peace there shall be no end. You know, if you went further on in the book of Isaiah to chapter 50, you'd be stuck right there in the action book just as if you were in the New Testament at the crucifixion scene where it says, He turned not his back from the smiters nor his face from them that plucked out the hair. When, when you get to the 53rd chapter of Isaiah, you're standing at the foot of the cross and you discover that he, this Jesus, he's the one who was wounded for your transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we were healed. In the book of Jeremiah and Lamentation, Jesus is the weeping prophet. In Ezekiel, he's the wonderful four-faced man. In the book of Daniel, he's the fourth man in the fiery furnace. In the book of Hosea, he's the eternal husband, forever married to the backslider. In the book of Joel, he's the baptizer with the Holy Ghost. In the book of Amos, he's our burden bearer. In Obadiah, he's the Lord our Savior. In Jonah, he's the great foreign missionary. In Micah, he's the messenger with beautiful feet. In Nahum, he is our avenger. In Habakkuk, he's the evangelist pleading for revival. In Zephaniah, he is the Lord mighty to save. In Haggai, he's the restorer of the lost heritage. And in Zechariah, he's the fountain open in the house of David for sin and uncleanness. And in Malachi, he's the son of righteousness rising with healing in his wings. And then, at the end of the Old Testament, we have four dumb centuries, 400 silent years. And then he, Jesus, bursts forth in the New Testament with a new dispensation and wise men bring him gifts and kings ponder him. As we walk into the New Testament, it's like we're walking into a building. The first thing we see as we walk in there, it's like there are four portraits hanging on the wall. The first one painted by Matthew. Portraits, each of them of Jesus. Matthew shows him as the Messiah. 
Mark shows him as the wonder worker. Luke shows him as a son of God, a son of man. And John, in John's gospel, John shows him as the son of God and God the son. Do you remember the words of John? Why don't you pause with me just for a moment for it opens so marvelously with these words. In the beginning was the word. See, that's one of his names. And the word was with God and the word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him and without him was not anything made that was made. And in him was life. And the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness and the darkness comprehended it not. And that was the true light which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. Ah, he was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. But to as many as will receive him, to them gives he the power to become the sons of God, even to them which believe on his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. For the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld His glory, His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Oh, see Him in John. In the book of Acts, He's the Holy Spirit moving and working among men. In Romans, He is our justifier. The book of Romans begins and opens very dismally because when they knew God, they worshipped Him not as God, neither were they thankful, but they became vain in their imaginations and their foolish heart was darkened, darkened. Darkened and professing themselves to be wise, they became fools and they changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like unto corruptible men and to birds and four footed beasts and creeping things. Not a very bright picture in chapter one. Chapter three doesn't get much better, for in that we learn in chapter three that uh, there is none that understandeth, there is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are altogether become unprofitable. There's none that doeth good, no, not one. Chapter 3 is no one for this verse. All sinned and came short of the glory of God. Not a very bright picture. But then along comes chapter 5, and it talks about the one of whom we speak about today, this Jesus. This chapter 5 begins, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. In the book of Romans, he's our justifier. In Corinthians, he's our sanctifier. In Galatians, he's the redeemer from the curse of the law. In Ephesians, he's the Christ of unsearchable riches. Unsearchable? Unsearchable riches? Unsearchable, not because they are hidden or hard to find, but unsearchable because they are inexhaustible. It's like one poet said, the reservoir of his resources never recede. The wisdom of his word, it never wanes. The vigor of his virtue, it never varies. The luster of his love, it never lessens. The prowess of his power, it never perishes. The burnish of his beauty, it never blemishes. You see, he is inexhaustible. And when you get to discover this person, who is the number one person in charge of the whole universe, and think about this. We get to explore the greatness of his personhood and to discover some of those inexhaustible riches that are ours in Christ. In Philippians, he's the Lord that supplies all of our needs. In Colossians, he's the fullness of the Godhead bodily. He's the head over all the church. In fact, as Scripture says in him, we live and move and have our being. In Thessalonians, he's our soon coming king. In Timothy, he's the only mediator between God and man. And in Titus, he's the faithful pastor. In Philemon, if you remember the story, he's the friend of the oppressed. In Hebrews, he's the blood of the everlasting covenant. In James, he's the Lord that raises up the sick. In Peter, he's the chief shepherd who soon shall appear. In 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, he is love. And in Jude, he is the Lord coming with 10,000 of his saints. And in Revelation, he is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Everybody needs to know him. People see him differently. And it's because there are so many facets of his personhood. Oh, like one writer said, you see, to the artist, he's the altogether lovely one. To the architect, he's the chief cornerstone. To the astronomer, he's the bright and the morning star. To the baker, he's the living bread. To the banker, he's the hidden treasure. To the beautician, 
he's the fairest of 10,000. To the biologist, he is life. To the builder, he's the sure foundation. To the designer, he's the originator. To the doctor, he's the great physician. To the educator, he's the great teacher. To the electrician, he's power. To the farmer, he's the lord of the harvest. To the florist, he's the rose of Sharon and the lily of the valley. To the geologist, he's the rock of ages. To the historian, he's the ancient of days. To the horticulturist, he's the true vine. To the jurist, He's the righteous judge, and to the jeweler, he's the pearl of great price, and to the lawyer, he's the counselor, lawgiver, and the advocate. To the musician, he's the harmonizer of all discords. To the oculist, he's the light of the world. To the philanthropist, he's the unspeakable gift. To the philosopher, he's the knowledge of God, and to the preacher, he's the wisdom of God. To the reporter, he's good news. To the sculptor, he's the living stone. To the servant, he's a good master. And to the sinner, he's the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sins of the world. To the statesman, he's the desire of all nations. To the student, he's the truth. To the theologian, he's the author and the finisher of our faith. To the traveler, he's the new and living way. And to the toiler, he's the giver of rest. And the victory is the prize. To the zoologist, he is the lion of the tribe of Judah. And there's nobody like him. And he's all we need. But none of this counts unless he means something to you. What is Jesus to you? And I want you to know that the wonder of this person is herein. That you can open your heart. And let him come walking over the pages of the Bible right into your life and become your Lord and Savior.